Yeah, I got that song stuck in my head. I was uh, actually uh, <laughs> I was actually listening to uh, another guy on YouTube, and um, he has a, a rendition of that song at the beginning of his, but it's it's been modified for Bible study type stuff. Uh, it's kind of funny. And uh, anyway, I'm not gonna get into it, although I I enjoy it and am entertained by it. Um, so disclaimer. Uh, before we get started here at 7 um, Tonight is probably not all that appropriate for um, young children um, If you haven't had the birds and the bees talk with your kids yet You probably want them out of earshot of this So uh, i got to make sure my own kids stay downstairs for this one um, Just uh, not that we're going to be crass or, or anything like that But uh, you know, if they're not ready to have that talk then you probably don't want them listening. So uh, I'll try to make that disclaimer as I see more people pop on here. But um, we'll be talking about some grown-up things tonight. Uh, we're in Leviticus chapter 15. <coughs> it's not COVID. But uh, <clears throat> we got uh, three topics, essentially, that we're going to cover tonight. And um, they're a little on the gross side, bodily functions kind of thing. Um, and... They're in here, so we're going to talk about them. Um, and of course, we'll we'll talk about uh, a couple of New Testament things as as we come to them as well. But uh, I just want to give everybody the opportunity to uh, get their kids out of the room if you are watching. So, all right, <clears throat> um, seven o'clock. Let's let's go ahead and get started. So this is probably going to be fairly quick. It's only uh, thirty something verses long and um not too much depth here um as far as that we've covered some of the concepts with the cleanness versus the uncleanness kind of thing uh we've covered quite a bit uh, i'm gonna have one major question for you guys to consider and if you would like even answer in the comments so um if you would like to do that um but uh, anyway um Let's go ahead and get started. It says, And Jehovah spake unto Moses and to Aaron, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, not to the Gentiles, not to the guys in the nation next door, uh, not to people 1,500 years in the future or 3,500 years in the future or what have you. No, this is to the children of Israel, as I've iterated many times before now. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, When any man hath a running issue out of his flesh... The modern parlance for that is diarrhea. If he has a running issue out of his flesh because of his issue, he is unclean. So we all know that. Um, I guess uh, this is one of those kind of Captain Obvious things here. But uh, in this sense, remember God is trying to keep Israel physically healthy on top of uh, teaching them spiritual truths. So this idea of uncleanness has two parts. Um, the first of it is the physical uncleanness. They could have a communicable disease. They don't want everybody in the camp. Remember, they're wandering out in the desert right now. They want everybody in the camp to um, get the diarrhea because that would be awful. Um, so they're considered unclean in the physical sense and need to stay away from everybody. <clears throat> but they also are considered unclean in the ceremonial sense of the word. So uh, that's something that uh, is, is still part and parcel with um, teaching them about sin and keeping themselves unspotted from the world, those kinds of things. Uh, so sickness uh, is really a teaching tool. And, and that's a, a, a an excellent point to ponder on tonight because we are going to be talking a little bit more about the 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 generic illnesses we're not talking about the the diseases of the skin now but the internal stuff um there's a lot of things that happen in the world um sickness and weather and uh just death things that um are not because of man's direct choice like we we don't say that a hurricane killed somebody because somebody sinned 
um, in in the generic, in the, like in the right now sense. Like we're not talking about ooh. Like you hear some people say that ooh, Louisiana sinned, and so Katrina went in and, and you know punished them and stuff. No, it's not how it works. Hurricanes are just part of weather patterns. They are an indirect result of man's sin, of course, because before the flood, the the world was a much better, more stable place in terms of the weather patterns because of the, the protective canopy overhead and the way that the uh, there was a one single supercontinent and all kinds of stuff that was going on that kept everything very stable and and still a very, very great place to live, even though we weren't in the Garden of Eden anymore. After the flood, of course, um, that protective canopy is gone. The atmosphere is stirred up. There's mountains and all kinds of things that are now causing these weather patterns that result in hurricanes, tornadoes, and the like. <coughs> so, um, I got uh, former students messaging me here. That's cool. Um, but anyway, just the things that we see in that regard, whether it be weather or whether it be diarrhea or whether it be uh, any of these natural things that are at least inconvenient for us, if not worse, um, <clears throat> they're things that teach us. Even today, they still teach us things. They teach us patience. They teach us about, um, you know, corruption and, and sin and those kinds of things. So there, there are things to pay attention to uh, even today and, and understand what is their ultimate source? Why do these things happen? And those aren't bad questions. You know, some people are like, you shouldn't, you should never challenge God. You should never ask God. Totally ask God. Job asked God, and he was considered a righteous man. You know, why God did, did this hurricane happen? Why did my child die? It's okay to ask those questions if you're respectful about it and you're truly wanting to know an answer as opposed to you just want somebody to blame. Because if you're blaming God, you're blaming the wrong person. God's, God is not the, the uh, one to bear the blame for the random deaths of people because of, of disease or because of, of weather or something like this. Man is. Man's wickedness is the reason those things exist. And so he is the one that properly bears the blame of those things. But anyway, that's just, that's just the interesting point to be made from uh, the, the idea of, in this case, diarrhea. So I just wanted to, to kind of bring that out. But we're going to head through this, and I'm not going to sit there and belabor that point. Um, and this, is, this shall be his uncleanness and his issue, whether his flesh run with his issue, diarrhea, or his flesh be stopped from his issue, constipation. Either one of those. Maybe he had too much cheese, but maybe he has a communicable disease and uh, he's going to be considered unclean. It is his uncleanness. And then it gets into some specific details here to prevent contamination. Every bed whereon he lieth that hath the issue is unclean, and everything whereon he sitteth shall be unclean. And whosoever touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. So that's the, the kind of the second party contamination there. That person has to go wash up and uh, they're considered unclean and can't be touched until even or everybody that touches them is considered unclean has to go wash up and all that. <clears throat> he that sitteth on anything whereon he sat that hath the issue shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until even. So if you sat on a chair that the guy with diarrhea sat on, you're unclean until even, you got to go clean up. He that touches the flesh of him that hath the issue shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until even. So the secondary guy, the one that doesn't have the diarrhea but comes into contact with things in the immediate vicinity that have come into contact with the guy with diarrhea, he's considered unclean until even has to go wash up. Okay, then verse 8, And if he that has the issue spit upon him that is clean, Okay, and that doesn't mean necessarily that he's like, I got diarrhea, I'm going to spit on everybody. Um, just like today, you know, uh, those of us who are asymptomatic or whatever, we're not out there going around spitting on people uh, to try to get them sick or something, like as if we had COVID or, or whatever. That's silliness. But what this is talking about is that if there's an indirect, uh, you know, some type of when people um, speak, you know, they're going to, some spit stuff's going to come out from time to time. I was a teacher, you know, I've been a teacher for a while. It's happened to me a couple of times in college. I'm sure those of us that, that went to college or trade school or whatever, or have been in any kind of classroom setting before, if we sat too close to the teacher 
you know, you want to bring an umbrella. Certain teachers are, were like that. So just an accidental or incidental uh, thing that's being talked about here. But of course, a purposeful one too could be in mind. But if, if the guy that has the, the um, diarrhea somehow has spittle that falls on somebody who doesn't, then that guy is considered unclean until even. Uh, he shall wash his clothes, bathe himself in water, and be unclean until even. Um, and this is, of course, we know because of the way that diseases can be transmitted. That doesn't mean that every disease is transmitted the same way uh, every time, but God's not going to sit down and give them a microbiology lesson. He just says, do this. And he uses it to teach them about spiritual things. We know that he also had uh, a simple physical preserve the Israelites kind of thing going on as well because we, we have that look back that we can do. So, anyway, um, verse 9, And what saddle soever he rideth upon, that hath the issue shall be unclean. So you ride in a saddle. The saddle itself is unclean. Um, apparently not the horse or, or whatever he was riding is not mentioned here, but uh, the saddle is considered unclean. And whosoever touches anything that was under him shall be unclean until the even. And he that beareth any of those things shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until even. And whomsoever he touches that hath the issue, and hath not rinsed his hands in water, he shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until even. Big deal about washing the hands. And that's kind of a grown-up thing to do. You shouldn't have to be told to wash your hands after you go to the bathroom or uh, if you do something gross, you know, um, you change your baby's diapers, those kinds of things. Wash your hands. That's That's been a thing forever. Just do it. Okay, that's that's not something that's hard, but here you get it from God. It's not it's not you know some doctor up in the White House or uh, even your family doctor or whatever telling you to do this or your teacher telling you to do this in kindergarten. No, this is God. If you come into contact with somebody who's sick, wash your hands. Okay, uh, and then verse twelve, uh, and the vessel of earth that he touches, which hath issue, shall be broken. So the 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 cheap kind of clay pots or whatever, they would just break them. They wouldn't even wouldn't mess with it and then every vessel of wood shall be rinsed in water and when he has an issue he that hath an issue is cleansed of his issue he stops having diarrhea and he shall number to himself seven days for his cleansing again we get to the seven days of this one week thing um, wash his clothes and bathe his flesh in running water and he shall be clean again this is this is an allusion to this idea of recreation seven days of creation seven days for cleansing being recreated just like when we are cleansed of our sin when we go down into the watery grave of baptism we come up a new creation a new creature and so that's all part and parcel of what's being taught here and it was drilled into the israelites uh, so that they would understand it when it came along, when Messiah came along and started teaching these things on a more spiritual level. A lot of them didn't get it. Some of them did. Um, a lot of us today don't get it because we don't study the Old Testament like we should. Then on the eighth day he shall take unto him two turtle doves or two young pigeons and come before Jehovah unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and give them unto the priest. So he's going to bring an offering. <clears throat> And the priest shall offer them, the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for him before Jehovah for his issue. That's not saying that diarrhea is sinful. If anybody is trying to attack the Bible and they say that, then they're silly. Hey Derek, welcome aboard. Um, just fair warning, we're talking about some grown-up stuff tonight. If you have kids, you may not want them uh, watching in. <clears throat> but uh, anyway, the idea here is is that this is supposed to be teaching about sin. The, the uncleanness is a symbol, is a ritualistic or ceremonial form of sin. Just as the animals can't really take away sin, they're just emblematic or looking forward to Christ. And so that's why they offer these offerings. When they do something or have something that is representative of sin, then they do something that is representative of getting rid of that sin. That, all fits nice and neat here because they're not actually getting rid of their sin um, they're not they're not actually sinning by doing these things that make them unclean necessarily so all right um, verse 16 this is where we get into a little bit of the grown-up stuff here so I'll give you a minute if you have any kids if you guys are watching you have any kids that are in here um, now's the time to get them out but um, we're gonna talk briefly 
briefly. Um, it's just three verses, but you know it's in here, so we're going to talk about it. We're not going to shy away from any part of the Bible. God thought it was important enough to inspire to the Holy Spirit, or for the Holy Spirit to inspire uh, Moses and others to write about it. So we're going to talk about it. <clears throat> All right. As a verse 16, if any man's seed of copulation, for those of you who don't speak King James, that's sperm. If any man's seed of copulation or sperm go out from him, then he shall wash all his flesh in water and be unclean until even. And every garment and every skin whereon is the seed of copulation or sperm shall be washed with water and be unclean until even. The woman also with whom man shall lie with the seed of copulation, they shall both bathe themselves in water and be unclean until even. I'm not going to get crass about it, um, but I do want to say that this idea here of seed is important. Okay, There's the the idea of seed is talked about all throughout the Old Testament. the The idea of the creation of the next generation of reproduction has been here since Genesis chapter one. Um, Be fruitful and multiply, that kind of thing. Uh, replenish the earth is what the King James says there. Um, so the, this idea of carrying on the, the human population is very, very important. But we also talk about, in terms of spiritual seed and planting spiritual seed, not in the gross grown-up context here, but uh, more in the planting of a seed uh, in the dirt or whatever. And we know that that's the Word of God. And, um, you know, there's, there's places in the Bible where those kind of things are alluded to. You know, what is the church? The church is the bride of Christ. Um, did they consummate the marriage? Yes, they had many children. And there's no need to be gross about it, as some try to be when they're attacking the Bible. But the metaphor is is that when that seed is planted, then you have somebody who is uh, born into the family of God or reborn into the family of God. And so all of those metaphors here are being alluded to uh, at least loosely by the things that we're talking about here and so there is um, a physical side to this the the seed here is considered something that makes you unclean um, because it's not holy it's not the um, oh what's the word I'm looking for it, it, it's not the thing that we're really focused on that would make us whole and spiritual and 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 righteous. Uh, the the seed that we're talking about here is just physical copulation. There's all kinds of problems uh, that come out of that adultery, fornication, those kinds of things that can make the act wrong. This is not a Catholic teaching. We're not saying that sex itself is wrong. Sex is is what man was created for in order to reproduce. Um, so there's nothing wrong with with having sex if you're married and if you are producing children um and and you know there's there's that whole relationship thing here that, that has to be going on but you know it can be abused just like anything else that god created everything that god created was good and right according to genesis chapter one right he said it was very good but some of the things that he created man because he has free will can choose to abuse and, and use the wrong way and so this is this is where all of this is coming from is is just kind of teaching those kinds of lessons and they'll come back up we'll see them again we'll talk about them like adults and then we'll move on so all right then verse 19 <clears throat> if a woman has an issue and her issue in her flesh be blood so we're talking about her period menstrual cycle however you want to phrase it she shall be put apart seven days so that put apart there means that she is isolated uh, in some cases they had to actually go out of the city um, and whosoever touches her shall be unclean until even, just like the diarrhea. And everything that she lies upon in her separation shall be unclean, and everything also that she sits upon shall be unclean. Whosoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until even. I want to want to touch on something real, kind of nuanced, technical here. A woman has the period. Whosoever touches her bed shall wash his clothes. If a woman was on her period in this camp kind of setting or whatever, who's most likely going to be tending to her? Yes, probably her husband if she's married, but also th probably you're talking about females. Thanks, Jacob. I appreciate that. 
um, you probably have the females that are the ones that are that are that are caring for the other women that are on their menstrual cycle, right? So it says his clothes and bathe himself. This word and this word, and a lot of the times when we see the male pronouns, the male pronouns are being used generically. And every it's anybody. That's just the way that the Bible, particularly the King James, and a lot of the other translations speak. And so there's a lot of times where we read something and it looks like it's only talking about men and maybe is a benefit for men within the spiritual realm especially. And that's not really what's being taught. It's really that it's just mankind. It's just that generic way of referring to things and it applies both to males and to females. So a lot of people read these things and they see all these male pronouns and they say, well, this is just, this is just a man's world. It's just the patriarchy and they get all up in arms. Yes, men do have the authority in the Bible. That's the God is male in his um, identity because of his authority. And so there's that aspect of it. But there's a lot of, of things that are talked about that are benefits that are actually to mankind. And it's just that the Bible uses those um, male pronouns. This is one of those places, places because if we were to get really, really technical and say, well, you know, it says wash his clothes and bathe himself. That means if she's cared for by a female, the female doesn't have to wash their clothes. They don't have to bathe themselves in that. And that's not, that's not, that's ridiculous. So. Anyway, I just wanted to, it's kind of a technical nuance thing, but it's important to, because there will be people that will bring it up, especially today's age when people can't identify themselves properly. Um, so I just thought I'd bring that up. And uh, then verse 22, And whosoever touches anything that she sat upon shall wash his clothes and bathe himself in water and be unclean until the even. And if it, if it be on her bed or in, on anything whereon she sits, when he touches it, he shall be unclean until the even. Uh, and if any man lie with her, of course, that's talking about sex, and her flowers be upon him. That's, he gets she gets blood on him. He shall be unclean seven days, and all the bed wherein he lies sh shall be unclean. So, again, kind of grown up issues here, but they happen. They're they're part of the design of of mankind, particularly of women. They're going to be on their period, and these things are going to happen. And so, when they happen to the children of Israel. You know, when, when my wife is on her period, I'm not kicking her out of the house for seven days because we're not under that covenant, okay? But at this time, under this law, these particular people have to do this. Now, for those who claim to be living by the old law, this is not the soteriology. This is not excusable under, well, Jesus was a sacrifice. So we don't have to do sacrifices anymore. My question to you is, do you kick your women out of the house or do they separate from you for seven days after their period's over? Because if so, they're unclean while they're on it and then uh, considered unclean for seven days out of it. That's two out of every four weeks, essentially, that you have to stay away from her or be considered unclean. Do y'all do that? Or is this just one of those that y'all gloss over? All right, um, verse 25, if a woman have an issue of her blood many days out of the time of her separation or if it run beyond the time of her separation, in other words, it goes past that seven day uh, cycle, all the days of the issue of her uncleanness shall be as the days of her separation, she shall be unclean. We actually read about this in the New Testament. Um, there was a woman who had an issue for uh, 12 years. Uh, this is found in Matthew 9.20, Mark 5.25, Luke 8.43. And she was healed by just touching. The, Jesus did not actively heal her. She just believed if I could just touch the, um, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. That's how much faith she had in Jesus. And so um, she did. And Jesus was like, "Who touched me?" And he's of course teaching. He knows. And she saw that she had been found out. And so she explains herself. And Jesus says, your faith has made you whole, you know, going about your, your business. Now, the question I have is, Jesus didn't consider himself unclean until even. He didn't separate himself, and he didn't say, don't touch me. In fact, right after that, somebody said, my little girl is dead. 
um, and he comes to their house, tells everybody to get out of the room, and he takes her hand. Remember, he's a, you know he's already been touched by this woman who was uh, had an issue for twelve years or whatever. Touch, touches her by the hand and raises her from the dead, touching a dead thing. Also, supposed to make you uh, unclean according to the law of Moses. Why could Jesus do these things without being unclean? Okay, just think about that for a second. Why could Jesus be touched by this woman who had an issue for 12 whole years and then turn right around and go and touch a dead body and not have to go through all of the, the washing rituals? The answer is, is that Jesus is the great purifier. His role was the purifying of the people. And by her touching him, she was purified rather than her making him unclean. And by him touching the little girl and bringing her back to life, he cleansed her or, or purified her of the physical death rather than being made unclean. And so it was a testament that the idea of, of Jesus being able to do some of these miracles, there's a layer to it that we don't ever talk about. I've never heard anybody talk about well, if Jesus is touching all of these sick people, if he's touching these dead people and bringing them back to life, where is the law of Moses in terms of cleanness and uncleanness? And the, the reality is, is that because Jesus is purifying them, he is like that running water. Remember we talked about if there was a big enough body of water, or if the water was running, it was not considered unclean. Well, that's, that's what Jesus is. And because of his purifying ability, then he did not uh, have to go and do all of the ritual cleansing because he was purifying uh, in and of himself. All right, back to Leviticus 15, verse 26. Every bed whereon she lies all the days of her issue uh, shall be unto her as the bed of her separation, and whatsoever she sits upon shall be unclean as the uncleanness of her separation. Whosoever touches those things shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes, and bathe himself in water, and be unclean until the even. But if she be cleansed of her issue, then she shall number to herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean. So the woman who touched the hem of Jesus' garment, she was cleansed right then of her separation. What did she have to do? She had to count seven days. And then she had to go, verse 29, on the eighth day, take, she shall take two turtle doves or two young pigeons and bring them to the priest to the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And the priest shall offer one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. And the priest shall make an atonement for her before Jehovah for the issue of her uncleanness. So even, even the lady, remember Jesus is still alive. He hadn't died on the cross yet. He hadn't taken the old law out of the way. So she was obligated because she had been cleansed of her issue. She still is obligated to take the two birds to the priest uh, so that the priest could offer atonement for her. <clears throat> and then the last three verses. Thus shall you separate the children of Israel. Who? The children of Israel. Not Gentiles 1,500 years down the road. Not everybody in the whole world 3,500 years down the road. That's where we are. From their uncleanness, the children of Israel from their uncleanness, remember this is a metaphor for sin, that they die not in their uncleanness when they defile my tabernacle that is among them. So if they go into the tabernacle with any of these, they are considered unclean. They're, they're trying to corrupt the tabernacle and later the temple by bringing this uncleanness into it. <clears throat> and so God is teaching them how important it is to keep, in the physical sense, the disease and everything out of the tabernacle, out of the temple. It's supposed to be pure and holy. And they're, they're not supposed to bring that kind of filth, in this case a physical kind of filth, into it. In the same way, the New Testament temple, which is the church, is not supposed to have that spiritual filth brought into it. And Paul talks about that in places like 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and 10, where he talks about all of the, the unclean things, all of the, the wicked things, the adultery and the, the, the fornication and the, the uh, murder and the theft and all of those kinds of things. All of the, <clears throat> the evil things that somebody could do, those are not to be part of the temple. If somebody is doing those things, 
Number one, they have to repent before they can become part of the temple. They have to change their ways. They have to be cleansed. Where does the cleansing take place? It takes place in baptism. Okay, they have to be washed, and then they are added to the temple as a brick in the temple. And if they are in the temple, if they are a Christian, and they start to go, fall back into those things, and, and they, they get get caught up in those things, it's not just a stumble, but they, they turn around and start to walk in darkness, what do you do? You take the stones out, and you cast them out. Just like we studied last last time, yesterday. Okay, so this is this is the lesson that is being taught here. It's not just dealing with disease and stuff in a physical sense. It's actually lessons for them to learn. This is the law of him that has an issue, diarrhea, of him whose seed goes from him, sperm, and is de defiled therewith, or uh, or and of her that is sick of her flowers, talking about the period, and of him that has an issue, uh, of the man and of the woman, and of him that lies with her that is unclean. Okay, so all of these things, this is the law concerning those things. That's what this, this summary here is all about. So right at 30 minutes. This was a really good one, nice short one here. So uh, thanks for, for joining me tonight, even though it was a, a little bit of grown-up stuff tonight. Um, like I said, I'm not going to shy away from talking about anything. If it's in the Bible, it needs to be talked about because it's in there. Um, but uh, we'll try to do one tomorrow. We'll see. Um, Saturday and Sunday I have a little bit more of my time during the day but I'm also still working on uh, a rebuttal to um, that debate that I talked about and so I'll be adding the, the second part of that uh, and I'll need to edit those down and stuff before I get them posted so those will be in a different category under YouTube and I'm not doing those live so uh, anyway y'all have a wonderful night and we will see y'all hopefully tomorrow